So um, here to talk about um, the NAS database and some of the uh, tools that we've been able to develop uh, using funding through this Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Small Grants Program over the last five or six years. So um, a little bit of a brief overview about the database for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, we are the uh, central federal repository for information on non-indigenous aquatic species data. Uh, we've been around for quite a while, but we've been the, uh, in some form or another since the late 80s, but um, with the um, non-indigenous aquatic use and species Prevention and Control Act in 1990. Um, this was kind of the first genesis of the database. Um, we track a large number of species and we have a lot of data. Uh, there's an asterisk about the, on the total records number. That's not even right now. It was right when I made this presentation a few days ago. Uh, we are adding data basically every day and that even number of species is wrong. Um, so we have more than 1,300 species that we track. Um, we track uh, obligate and facultative aquatic taxa. Uh, basically, if it lives in the water anywhere it's not supposed to, anywhere in the US, we try to keep track of it. Um, so includes the, the continental US, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, all the island territories. Uh, we are starting to expand out into the transboundary waters uh, between the US and Canada, and we are working to uh, with the Canadian government and other agencies to incorporate data from Canada as well. Uh, our data set stretches all the way back to the early to mid 1800s uh, and up into or up to today. Uh, so the, the database is, comprises a couple of different parts. Um, the most people know us for our uh, profiles and our distribution maps. Um, all of our data, uh, we work with both uh, with federal, state, uh, and local agencies to uh, aggregate and integrate uh, data on non-indigenous aquatic species. Uh, we extract data from the primary literature, news articles, museum collection databases, uh, citizen science uh, programs such as iNaturalist, uh, as well as we take uh, direct submissions of citizen science reports through our website. Um, our species profiles uh, here, these are uh, synthetic summaries of uh, information about a introduced taxon, biology, ecology, identification, uh, impacts, uh, status, uh, potential pathways, and other information. Our distribution maps are uh, live at all times. Uh, these include the distribution of uh, species across the US, uh, its native range, if it's a native transplant, um, as well as the, the ability to uh, do some rudimentary GIS queries to kind of filter data on the map as well. And then, uh, over the last few years, we've had a big push to what we are calling uh, actual maps and tools. And these include a number of these um, projects that I've talked to you about that have been funded through the, through the um, ANIS Small Grants Program. So basically we have this big data set, um, but the data isn't useful just sitting in a database for people just to look at. Um, how can we uh, leverage this data uh, into uh, prevention and control efforts? And then, um, you know, we track a lot of species. Uh, some of the more high profile species that we track would include things like the invasive carps, so big head silver grass and black carps, uh, uh, dreseeded mussels in the uh, Great Lakes and uh, Mississippi River basins, uh, round goby introduced in the Great Lakes, and then uh, lionfish, another one of the big packs that we track. So this animated GIF kind of shows the, the spread of lionfish around the, uh, the Atlantic and Caribbean over the last 20 years since 1985. So uh, projects I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about five today, kind of give you a brief overview of these projects. These include um, aquatic plant range expansions, uh, the alert risk mapper, um, our impact tables, uh, our eDNA data standards and integration, and then the, the Puerto Rico horizon scan. So we'll start off with the aquatic plant range expansions. Uh, this project um, was funded starting back in 2016 and finished in 2017. Uh, the, uh, the plant data within the NAS database um, has a, a slightly complicated history due to funding for uh, botanist positions. We had it for a little while, it went away and came back in 2015. Um, and this uh, project was to kind of help um, beef up our, our plant data holdings, uh, focused on uh, intrasquatic taxa in the Southeast. Um, this project identified uh, 60 species that had significant range expansions and then also provided a detailed review of 
uh, 14 previously established species, as well as documenting uh, nine newly established species uh, within the Southeast region. So this is an example of one of the map from the ports, uh, looking at analysis of uh, across the Southeast region, um, how many uh, new plant taxa were identified uh, within Huck 8 watersheds or Huck 8 drainages um, from 2001 to 2016. Uh, of course, Florida, everything loves to get introduced into Florida and move around. So Florida obviously has a lot there, um, but you can kind of see the distribution across the, the southeast and the island territories. Uh, and then, you know, looking at the introduction history of a couple of, of particular species, for example, parrot feather, uh, found widely throughout Florida and, and the coastal regions, but you see some movement into uh, around some of the interior watersheds as well. Uh, and then uh, giant salvinia, this is one of the federally listed noxious weeds. You see uh, some distribution in Florida in a few states, but also some movement of this plant as well. The alert risk member. Um, so this is an interesting project. So the um, one of the main um, roles for the NAS database is, uh, is in helping with early detection and rapid response for, for non-native aquatic species. So our alert system, uh, this was developed in 2004, and it's a, an opt-in system to, do, to alert notif and notify uh, registered users of a new introduction um, within, a, within the country. Uh, this is done at four hierarchical levels, species that are new to the country, new to a particular state, uh, new to a particular county within a state, um, or new to a Huck 8 watershed. Uh, when users sign, these are all push notifications, so they get emailed out. Um, and when users register for part of the system, they uh, can sign up for either getting alerts for a particular state, uh, including um, or a number of different states or a particular region. So for example, we have all the ANS regional panel regions as you can just one click and select all of those. <clears throat> uh, you can sign up for a particular taxonomic group. If you're only interested in fishes, you could just get all the fish information or uh, you could sign up for alerts about a uh, particular taxon of importance. And, uh, and so you could also, so we email these alerts out with kind of the information about the introduction, where, when, um, what's this new, um, new place. And then on the website, you kind of filter through all of these alerts um, as well. So and that's an example on the, on the right there uh, about what this summary would look like. And then you could click on um, one of those particular alerts and get more information, get a map and all the detailed specimen information. Uh, and this kind of shows an example of uh, distribution of alerts uh, for the first half of 2019. Uh, you can see a lot of them are closer in Florida and most of these are usually uh, drainage alerts, so things that have moved into a new watershed. <laughs> so the alert risk mapper, um, this was created in 2018 and this the goal of this project was to try to provide a short-term risk assessment, so kind of looking over the next six months or so, um, about the potential for a species spread um, from a new observation, from a new introduction. And this takes into account uh, species movement potential within the drainage using species like history. Is it a passive or active disperser? Uh, does it require specific uh, flow rates? So is it a big river species or is it a headwater species? Um, and you know, what are the flow rates within there? Uh, also the presence of barriers such as uh, dams or waterfalls. So uh, this, so these maps, they include, uh, so the information from the alert is also included on here. We have a regional view of the, uh, where this observation is located. So in this case, um, this is a big head carp record. Um, and the White River, so just over the border um, in Missouri from Arkansas, you can see kind of where all the other observations of the species are in the region. Those are the little uh, diamonds and then we star there. And then we have the, uh, the, the actual location, including the uh, potential areas at risk. So, you know, if this thing would just be dispersing within the region, um, where might you want to go looking for it? So this is to help give an example for managers, uh, a, a narrower, a little narrower view of um, where they might want to do survey efforts if they're looking for additional, um, they're looking for this taxa in this area. All right, uh, impact tables. Um, this uh, project was started in 2018, and this was started for a list of 100 um, species uh, in the Southeast region. 
Um, this is a six expanded out um, to more attacks as well. Um, so this is an exhaustive uh, literature search looking for um, and a review of the documented impacts. Um, you know, everyone's read in papers about how a species might have this impact or it will impact native taxa, um, but there's not a lot of citations behind it. And then that, that claim gets repeated in a, in a game of telephone through the literature. So the whole goal of this was to try to get back to the original source, find the documentation for, or lack of documentation thereof for impacts for particular taxa. So this is both um, works to look at as a summary of impacts and also a, um, an area for future research. So what might need to be, um, what doesn't have documentation to it. Uh, uh, this looks at uh, impacts over both uh, ecological and uh, economic categories. So um, does it compete with other taxa? Does it have food web impacts? Does it impact water quality? Uh, and then for the, on the economic side, does it have um, impacts to infrastructure? Uh, for example, like dressing and mussels, uh, clogging power plant intakes, which would then have uh, reduce um, power plant capacity and increased maintenance and et cetera, so there's an impact. And so we, uh, we do a, a pretty exhaustive literature search um, for impacts for a particular taxon. Uh, we also even look for anecdotal claims to see if there's things that have you know, very low support. Um, and then we uh, package all this up into a summary on our uh, species profile pages with some um, little handy little icons that look kind of like this. Um, this gives you a quick summary of, uh, of an overview of the impacts. Um, those impacts are clickable. So even though, so we've gone through and, and extracted all the impacts and put them into a database, you can click on each one of those icons and go to a list of all of those individual uh, impacts that we've extracted out of the literature as well. Um, <laughs> some future goals for this are to potentially look at what are some of the more impactful taxa, obviously um, things like dressing and muscles and carp which should have a number of impacts listed. Uh, we're also trying to tie in um, what are the species that are being impacted by a particular taxon um, using things like um, uh, itis uh, taxonic serial numbers. Uh, so we can look at, try to quantify a little more about what species are having the most broadest taxonomic impacts or what species are being impacted the most by, by non-native species. Um, you can, um, when you search for uh, a species on our website, you can then have, click on impacts itself too. And then this will give you a brief little summary of all the impacts. So for example, this is for uh, Canadian waterweed. We can see that it has um, competition, habitat alteration, and you know, some recreation impact. And if you click on one of those uh, impact IDs, this will give you the full description, including a citation or a link to the reference, uh, what the impact is described in that particular piece of work. Um, and then where that impact was documented. So, uh, our next one would be our eDNA data standards. Um, eDNA um, is a kind of a fairly powerful new tool um, because you don't need to sample DNA directly from an organism, you can get it directly from the environment, either through a water, air, or soil sample. Um, this is an extremely powerful tool for biosurveillance, not only for uh, native species, but also for um, uh, rare or threatened taxa or taxa that are hard to, uh, hard to sample just because they are cryptic or um, live in, in hard environments. So some of the goals for, uh, for integrating this into the NIS database, obviously, um, as uh, or organisms are sloughing off uh, genetic material into the environment, it might be easier to sample that just through sampling the environment rather than actually collecting an organism directly. Um, this will also help provide a unified source for integrated um, physical and genetic observations for aquatic invasive species, um, and also make a portal for um, natural resource managers, uh, academia, and the public uh, to be able to uh, look at uh, eDNA project sampling uh, across uh, the nation. Uh, our plans are also to incorporate eDNA into our existing EDRR frameworks and tools, such as the Alert Risk Mapper uh, and some of the other tools I'll mention in a moment. Uh, this is not designed to be a trusted data repository like GenBank um, or the eDNA Atlas that, uh, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We've got a URL down there in the bottom corner, which is kind of our landing page um, for all these efforts, and we'll be updated as we go along. Um, so we're working on three different portions for this: um, some community standards for data sharing and integration into the database to help. 
um, define what 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 studies would meet our our our, our needs. Uh, communication plan to how can we communicate in this information out to uh, natural resource managers. Um, there is a little bit of trepidation with the use of eDNA for, for management purposes. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we uh, uh, don't rush into things and no one's blindsided with this information. And then um, data on all of our distribution maps. Um, for these eDNA standards, we've uh, taken a community approach to kind of developing these for the integration into the mass database, which has involved uh, a number of uh, workshops and webinars to primarily targeted at natural resource managers to talk about these plans um, and make sure we get uh, community buy-in. Uh, we see this really as a tool for management. Um, also, we are working with a number of uh, leading EDA researchers in, in, in federal and federal labs and academia to look at what might be some of the minimum quality standards for an assay. So for example, um, has it been, uh, has the assay been verified? Do you have certain um, negative controls? Have you done uh, field and laboratory blanks as part of your processing? So if, a, if an assay, assay would need to have a number of these little check boxes to meet the standards, make sure it's, you know, of a high quality, uh, high quality assay. And that would help add a little bit of trust in the results so that when you see a positive detection for a species in, in a location, you can hopefully rule out any of the, of the potential ideas for false positives or a detection of genetic treatment of organism when, there's, when it's not actually there. Um, we're also developing a communication plan for how we communicate this information to managers. So for example, we get in data, we give, we, um, we go through a kind of a screening process with a data source uh, before it would get entered into the NAS database. Um, these then get filtered through with our community standards. Um, we incorporate this data into the NAS database, but we don't make it publicly available. We talk with any of the, uh, the pertinent um, natural resource management agencies within that jurisdiction where the detection occurred. So maybe that would be Fish and Wildlife Service, it's on, on federal managed lands, it would be uh, the different state AS um, agencies. Um, in states where that detection would occur um, to allow um, time for any sort of management action to take place if there is going to be one. So um, we wanna make sure that everyone gets signs off so you say that, okay, we're comfortable with this data potentially being released publicly, we're not gonna do any sort of management action or you know, give us three months to go and do any surveys we might wanna do for this particular organism, see if there's any more out there. Um, and then we would embargo the data for for the length of time that everyone agrees on. Once all that length of time period is up and everyone's comfortable with it, we make it public to all of our part, um, to all of our partners and on the NAS database. Uh, here's kind of an example of what this might look like. We're still working on the integration process. So this is um, a distribution map for Northern Snakehead in um, Arkansas and Missouri. You can kind of see our um, existing data is here in the, uh, in the color circles, and we kind of envision the eDNA kind of showing either null detections or no detections, um, all or positive detections. So you kind of see the distribution uh, and potentially the leading edge of an introduction. All right, and the last thing um, would be the Puerto Rico horizon scan. As Cindy said, we've been working uh, doing a number of different horizon scans. This is looking at the organism and trade pathway to try to identify potentially problematic taxa before they get here. Uh, where this is in collaboration with uh, Dia Laurence from the University of Florida. Uh, we've worked with Dia uh, on a horizon scan for Florida itself. Um, uh, NAS, the NAS database has also worked with Fish and Wildlife Service doing a, a national horizon scan kind of on a global scale looking at organisms trade. So this takes uh, data from, um, for example, uh, import data from the Lemus list, um, looks at um, what are the most frequently imported taxa tries to rank them in order of abundance. And then we do a uh, expert assessment of the potential for the species to establish in the US, the potential for spread in the US if it gets established, and then the potential for impacts. Uh, this is done through a, a literature survey um, for that particular taxon, looking at these things, invasion history, um, what are its environmental tolerances, has it had in, um, previously documented impacts as well. Um, each of these species are scored on a one to five scale. So one would be low, in, you know, low potential for establishment impacts, five would be high. Um, these are the scores for these three different 
uh, categories are multiplied up and then they're ranked numerically with higher scoring taxa potentially being um, higher up on this risk assessment on the prize scan for um, that might want to be looked at further um, through a regulatory framework, whether that there is an import ban or a restriction of some sort on the um, on this taxon. A um, couple of our other action maps and tools that weren't developed through this project that I thought would be interesting to talk about just very briefly. Um, there are two, this is one we would call FAST, or the Flood and Storm Tracker. Um, this is kind of similar in scope to the, to the ARM maps um, where we do these little assessments after a, a hurricane or a major storm and look at, um, try to look at uh, flooding, rainfall, and assess if there are any, and high water mark data, and to assess if there are any potential um, lateral connections across hub bay drainages and where that might have provided a corridor for taxa to expand from one drainage to a new uh, drainage where it hasn't previously been seen. Uh, we've done this for every major storm since 2016, since Hurricane Harvey. Uh, SANED is another tool that is uh, an acronym for uh, screen and evaluate uh, invasive and non-indigenous uh, species data where we will provide the ability for um, a user, an agency, um, a fisherman, um, a, a active researcher to upload a CSV uh, to the website. We will screen this against all of our data, which include uh, native range layers for native taxa uh, and then current distributions for non-native taxa. Try to assign, uh, look to see if there's any data errors within their in their data set. Are there, are there spellings? Um, are there, uh, if it provides uh, information on the, the location, we will uh, then automatically assign things like um, state, county, um, uh, water body information from, from HUC 8 to HUC 12, link it to the national hydrography data set, uh, and then do some basic data quality checks. So if it says it's in Florida, but the, the, the geographic coordinates are in Georgia, we'll flag that as well. Um, so thank you for your time today. Um, here's all of my team. Um, this is a, a big project, and we've got a lot of great people that work on and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks, Matt. That was really a lot of, a lot of stuff there. So uh, a lot of good products, you know, that you guys pr providing. That's um, one thing I was gonna say. I mean, let me get this straight: is this, is all this stuff publicly available right now? Like this? Yes. And the, e the, e the so the eDNA data is not public yet. We're still right. working on the integration. Everything else is, and the the Puerto Rico Horizon scan is not been started yet. It's been funded. We're working on getting that going. Um, the other horizon scans are done and we're working on publications, but everything else is, all the tools and everything else is live. I think you have a few links in there too. If you wouldn't mind emailing those to Charlie after the meeting and maybe pass it to the group, we can access that and look at it. Thanks. Any other questions from, from Matt? John? Yeah, thank you. So on your uh, maps, your expansion maps, I noticed that a lot of that uh, expansion wasn't continuous. So. Um, are there vectors that we as state agency managers need to be looking out for? I assume that some of those are, are man-made vectors that are moving them from one watershed to the other, but are there other things that we need to be on the lookout for? And is that something you may want to put in the, the database so people can research it for certain species? You know, how is this species able to jump watersheds? And thank you. So, yeah, so a lot of our, our, our information on vectors, you know, we, we try to make some, some default assumptions um, for how species are transported. And most of those are usually, you know, as agencies you're aware of, you know, uh, for plants, it'd be things like water gardens or uh, plant sales, um, boat trailers um, for, uh, for fish, obviously um, uh, bait dealers or bait transport, um, um, you know, Invertebrate taxa, like like dressing and mussels, again, boat trailers or, or attachment organisms. Uh, um, most of those pathways, I think, are covered. I think the one place where people might want to, as agencies, you might want to look more into is internet sales of, of organisms. Uh, there's a lot of organisms that you see uh, in trade um, that even though your agency may have it listed on a prohibited list, um, people are still would still be selling it. Um, because that's a hard pathway to tackle, you know, um, as in 
a retailer, especially maybe if it's an online or small retailer, they may not be aware of or uh, of state, um, local state regulations that it's prohibited for them to sell an organism to an address in the state. And I don't know if there's an easy way of, of making that tractable. But um, the, uh, the Great Lakes Commission and the, the Great Lakes panel, um, they had in previous years developed a tool that they called Gladiator, which was looking for uh, so Great Lakes um, detection of organisms, which I don't remember exactly what it is, but basically it was a, uh, a web scraper that would go out and look for species that were being sold um, into the Great Lakes and then try to notify or work with those retailers to, to stop that. Uh, they're currently working on, um, on revamping that program, um, but something like that that might be a little more flexible or modifying that tool to work with work for your state um, might be a, a useful tool. The other thing um, to think about too is with the um, changes in court decisions about what the Lacey Act can and cannot do, the service doesn't have the ability to regulate interstate transport of anything. So unless an individual state chooses to identify specific invasives and prohibit them from entering their state, there's really no way to stop interstate transport, internet sales, or any of that. So it's now, you know, the responsibility of each state agency to decide, do you want to go to the trouble? Because I'm, you know, I'm sure it's a legislative issue across every state and it's all going to be different. But, but taking the time to identify what species you really don't want in your state and prohibit them. And that is the first step in slowing down the interstate transport, whether it's intentional or in, unintentional and internet sales. Because, I mean, when we talked about the Arapaya issue in Florida, you can still order them on eBay and ship them to your home. So aquarium dumping is, is a big source, and that's just a behavioral thing. People think it's better to let them go, but that's another story. But anyhow, so I just wanted to um, point out that part about the Lacey Act and the changes to our authority to do anything about that. I will add that um, one of the projects we're working on um, is to try to get a handle on what taxa are um, what taxes are regulated across states? So to try to look at commonalities. So we, one of our contractors was, uh, we sent them to look through all the state ANS management plans, look at the taxa that are uh, regulated or managed um, by state, whether it's prohibited or restricted or what. Um, and this is across, um, focusing mainly on aquatic, but this includes other other groups as well. Um, to try to get a sense of, you know, where are different species being regulated um, and to see if there are any gaps. And this will be, you know, we're going to make this available to our, our partners as well. So once we get this, um, you know, some of the regional groups like the Great Lakes Group is good about trying to harmonize regulations. So they specifically work on projects like that to make sure that um, the same taxa has the same regulations across the basin as well. Um, you know, working across agencies, you know, you know, neighbor agencies in neighboring states to harmonize regulations is a good, was a good thing to do. Um, but hopefully this other this project will help you guys do that to look at where things are regulated and and in what classification.